Okay, guys, so today we're going to talk about the Korean War, and we're kind of really zipping through these notes. Some of these slides are important, and some of them are a little bit excessive, so we'll kind of go through those quickly. So the Korean War is known as the Forgotten War. Why is that? Why do you think it was forgotten? Not a lot of what? Not a lot of people remember it. Why is that? Okay, so it's after World War II, so they're kind of out glamored by what happened in World War II. World War II happens in the 40s, this is in the 50s. That's one thing. Any other reason why you think it's forgotten? Yeah, we didn't come home with big flags victorious like we did in World War II. We don't like to remember ones where we don't have a big victory because it ended in a stalemate basically, right? And we went home, it was split. Now, we'll talk about whether that was a success or not. I mean, our goal in Korea was to not let communism spread. So did we succeed in doing that? That was our mission, so we did succeed in that. Some people forget that and think that we were trying to take over North Korea, and that was not our goal. But again, it wasn't clear compared to like World War II where you take territory. Yes, and that's why we have tension in North Korea. So that's why it's even so important for you guys to understand this, because it stems from way back then. You know? Okay, so let's take a look at our years here. The Korean War begins June 25th of 1950, and it ends July 27th of 1953. And we've already talked about why it was called the Forgotten War. So here's what happens. After World War II, Remember that um, Japan was invading, right? They were invading Korea, they were invading China. So what happens is Japan exits Korea in 1945 because they lost the war, right? Then immediately what happens is Korea is divided on the 38th parallel right here. And the communists run in and they start controlling the north part of Korea. And we think, oh man, We'd better hurry up and help because we're already afraid of communism. We don't like communism. So um, the guys that were like down in Japan, kind of maintaining after World War II, they end up going up into Korea because they've got to kind of keep control. We don't want to lose the whole country to communism. So it's split on the 38th. Uh, so the two Koreas are basically formed in 1948. You'll notice they both have separate capitals. The North's capital is Pyongyang. The South is Seoul. And I do want to point out, notice the location of the South Korean capital. Seoul is really close to that border, and that's going to be a problem here in this particular war. Okay. The Prime Minister uh, in North Korea, Kim Il-sung. The South Korean president at the time was Syngman Rhee. Do you remember doing the song, We Didn't Start the Fire, in American history? I know I haven't taught American history for a few years, but we always use that, too. I think Sturgeon does, right? Um, you'll hear Syngman Rhee in that song, right? And again, 38th parallel was the dividing line. Okay, now let's take a look at some of these differences. It's almost like taking West River and East River of South Dakota. They were very, very different. The North is poor and agricultural. A lot of farming going on up there. The South is ten, tends to be rich compared to the North and very industrial. A lot of cities, a lot of factories. The North, of course, is communist, and the South is democratic based on us. Now, at this time, we see a lot of nations becoming communist. We have North Korea, we have China, who's a huge power, and of course, we also have the Soviet Union that used to be Russia. Now they're Soviets because they've become communists. And we start worrying about the world. And so our word is containment. Just like you have a container of jello in the fridge, you want to contain it, keep it in its boundaries. So that is President Truman's foreign policy. We want to contain communism and stop the spread of it. And so every time a country is starting to look like it might fall, we jump over there to try to save it so that we don't uh, let it be communist. The first thing we do is we send money, and then if that doesn't work, then we start sending soldiers, 
And if that doesn't work, then we try to assassinate the leader. It's kind of the way it goes. Sad to say, but it is. So let's take a look. The first step of the war begins. Now on your semester test, you'll see you have to do this by stages, right? So the first stage is the North invades the South. They cross the 38th parallel and surprise everybody. The North sends 135,000 men across the border. And they attack Seoul, of course, the capital, and other strategic areas, other major cities and stuff like that. South Korea's response, obviously they were caught off guard by the surprise attack. They had fewer than 12 combat planes. Can you imagine? Definitely not ready for this. And some of those planes, by the way, were piloted by Americans because they happened to be there. So here's the next step in the war. Uh, the North occupies Seoul for two days, in two days, excuse me, within two days. They took it very quickly. And the South Korean government escapes. And they go all the way down here to Busan, which is right in the corner. And you'll notice by this map, they push all of the Southern Korean soldiers, any Americans that are there, all the way down to this border so that their back is against the wall. Basically, they're, they're, the water is their back. So we're in trouble, we're in trouble. And this is where we start seeing a load of soldiers coming from Japan into Korea, because they know they have to go help. Now, there are other names for the Korean War. Um, in Korea, they call it the 625 War in South Korea, because it started on June 26th, 625. Um, and sorry, this is covered up here. It says Fatherland Liberation War. In the North, that's what they call it, Fatherland Liberation War, because it's all about liberating the South from their democratic evil friends, basically. So let's take a look at some of the weapons we're using in Korea. Some are the same and some are different. Uh, we're gonna use tanks and planes, just like World War II, except the Koreans will be using Soviet supplies against us. Now think about that. In World War II, we were using those supplies together, right, against the Germans. Now we're using them against each other. This is the most common Russian tank that was used in both wars. This is a T-34, and uh, they used a lot of tanks in this war. This is a P-30, P-3D Sky Knight. It's a Navy plane, and you can tell because the wings fold up, meaning it's on the aircraft carrier. It takes up less space, right? We have a few new inventions. One of those things is MASH. It stands for Mobile Army Surgical Hospital. And what we were realizing is in World War II, we had to take these people that were wounded and we would take them back to an aid station. And that time that it took to take them to the aid station, a lot of guys died. So they said, we have got to be more immediate to help out our soldiers. So what they did is they made our doctors and our nurses more mobile so that they are right in the front lines so that we can get our soldiers there faster and save a few more lives. And it did really work, by the way. We still do it today, so it worked out really well. It means that our doctors and soldiers, by the way, are in more danger. How many of you have seen the show MASH? Now, it's kind of a fun show, but how many times did you see them having to move or they're under fire, right? And they're worried they're gonna get bombed or they are getting bombed because they are in hot territory. So it does mean they're in danger. We start seeing the use of helicopters in Korea. This is a new thing uh, for a couple of things, for spying, reconnaissance, for transport, of course, for troops, generals, and also to evacuate soldiers out if they're in trouble. Uh, the company that primarily made all of these was Bell Helicopter, which made a lot of money on this deal, by the way. They also made a lot of money in Vietnam. We also start seeing jet aircraft being used as compared to our regular planes that we saw in World War II. Um, the US here, for example, has an F-86 Sabre jet. The Soviets started using their MiG series, their MiG-15. And if you compare them, uh, by far the Soviets are faster. Um, the best thing our pilots could do is maneuver to try to get away because they honestly had a better jet than we did. Just like, you know, the Germans had better tanks in World War II. Unfortunately, we're defeated here a little bit. So the guy in charge is old Mac. Remember MacArthur that uh, 
did the surrender in the Pacific, right? He's in charge over here. He's the biggest name in Asia during World War II. He freed the countries from Japanese occupation. And he's the one that signed the official surrender on the ship here. So the United Nations at this point gets involved. They called North Korea people bandits for doing what they had done. The UN forces, like the United Nations police force that were there, they would wear these blue helmets that you see over here. So they called them the blue helmets for obvious reasons. Truman refers to South Korea in the United Nations as the Greece of the Far East. Because before this, right after World War II, Greece was suffering economically, kind of like it is right now, actually. And uh, we were afraid it was going to fall to communism. So we threw tons of money into Greece to try to save it. And he's saying, here, same thing's happening in Korea. We need to go in and help. Well, remember that the Soviets are a part of the United Nations, right? They are a member. So this is a little bit sneaky. To decide what should be done in Korea, they voted when the Soviets were out of the room. When they had run to the restroom or something, whatever, they were out of the room and they said, yes, we're going in to help South Korea. The Soviets were not a part of that vote. And they were really angry, as you can imagine, because they would not have voted that way. Um, so they start aiding North Korea, which is by United Nations vote, a violation because the United Nations says, no, we're gonna stop North Korea. So we see a divide in the United Nations and the US really begins the fight. You'll see the Eighth Army airlifted from Japan and brought right over to Korea to fight. And MacArthur is appointed to command the entire United Nations people, everybody, not just the US, but all of them. 15 countries make up the United Nations forces. And we start with a bombing raid. I love our sound effects, that was fun. We have 50 B-29 bombers. And we start targeting North Korean military bases, cities, and bridges. We're gonna show them our firepower. 32 critical bridges were destroyed. And I know that seems silly, oh, it's a bridge. Well, it means you can't get your troops through, you can't get supplies through, so they can be like surrounded or cut off, which is a good thing. So um, this just kind of tells you what they think as they're seeing their enemy. They called them small-bodied Korean soldiers because they were shorter and smaller than most American soldiers. They lacked naval and air support, but boy, were they well-prepared and they were very well-trained fighters because they've been fighting the Japanese, right? The Japanese had invaded. So um, they're very frustrated by that because they're good fighters. The North Korean fighters, as we said, were very well trained. And this is something that was very controversial. They were quick to disguise themselves. In World War II, you wore your uniform and you fought proudly in your uniform, right? Even if it meant you did a bonsai charge and you died in your uniform. Well, the North Koreans, they would go in and fight. And then to blend in with the community, they would take off their uniforms and wear civilian clothes. So they couldn't tell which one was which. Because there's really no difference between looking at North and South Koreans, right? So they were really mad about that. They said that was an honorable way to fight. Is this fair? Do we see this happening today? Yep. We're seeing that in Afghanistan and Iraq. They're not always wearing uniforms, right? So we're watching everybody around us to see if they're going to attack. Same idea. 10,000 communist troops are sitting in Seoul and we've got to take that capital back. So we got a plan. We're going to try to attack there coming up here. First of all, uh, we're, we're caught down in Busan, remember, right? So this becomes the first really bloody war, bloody battle of the war. The communists siege the entire city. And the battle lasted until September of 1950. So we gotta do something about it. This is one of the most brilliant tactics we did in the entire Korean War. And they didn't expect it. So we basically went from Busan and we landed on Incheon. We did it by Navy. So we went around. They never expected us in Incheon because the tides are really high and it's really rocky. So if you go in at the wrong time, we would be decimated. 
So they never thought we would ever use that bay, but we did. And notice it's nice and close to Seoul, which made it easier for us to get to Seoul and take the capital back. So it was a surprise attack and it worked very, very well. September 14th, 1950, 262 ships and 40,000 men invade Incheon. A lot of guys say that it reminded them of the invasion on Normandy. It was an amphibious attack, came in on the beaches, you know. UN forces attacked North Korean forces from behind because again, they weren't expecting it. Tens of thousands of communists were captured and 135,000 North Koreans surrender because of this attack. We're doing good. But then we start making a mistake. MacArthur, remember he was kind of cocky, right? Remember he's the one that, that broke all the rules with the emperor Hirohito, like he took pictures with him, shook his hand when he wasn't supposed to touch him, remember all that? He was kind of cocky and he said, I want to kick these communists out of here. So he basically doesn't stop at the DMZ or at the 38th parallel. He goes all the way through the north, up and over the Yalu River into China. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Not good. He is supposed to be following orders to contain communism, but he wanted to teach them a lesson. The North Koreans retreat beyond the Yalu River up here. Now, I understand this, though. If your enemy is hiding across a border, shouldn't you be able to go and get them, right? But what happens if we go into China to chase them? What are we worried about? Yeah, the, the communists, the Chinese are going to come in and fight with them, right? And that's exactly what happened. MacArthur wants to go into China, and China grows alarmed at the possible threat. And sure enough, the Chinese come in because he goes over that border. The president even told him not to do it, and he did it anyway. So the Chinese come in, and at first the guys have no idea they're Chinese. All they know is their enemy, right? And they're wearing North Korean uniforms, but they can't understand why there are so many soldiers all of a sudden. I mean, there are thousands and thousands. It's because the Chinese are fighting. 100,000 Chinese soldiers add into the fight, and of course China is denying everything at the United Nations. What are you talking about? We're not fighting in Korea, you know? So, of course, we know most of this because of the after effects of the way we know, okay? So let's take a look at what happens now. Mao Zedong sent Chinese troops into the Korean War, as we said, and they drove the U.S. forces all the way back beyond the 38th parallel. Terrible loss for the U.S. And not only that, we get a group of guys that are trapped right here called the Chosen Reservoir, otherwise known as the Frozen Chosen. You maybe have heard of that before. It was a very bad moment for our guys. It was called the Frozen Chosen because it was terrible weather, like the worst winter weather ever, 30 below, you know, wind chill, all that fun stuff. The communist troops surround the U.S. The siege lasted from November 26th through December 13th of 1950. And eventually, our guys, they had to be evacuated. So what happened, um, I'm going to show you on this map here quick. Sorry, I'm going to go back for a second. Okay, so what they did, they eventually escaped out of the siege, and they went this direction to a port city called Hangnam. But it was interesting, they didn't want the, the North Koreans or the Chinese to use that port. So when they left on the ships at Hangnam, they destroyed the port, they blew up everything so that the enemy couldn't use it. But that looks like a really bad defeat for us, doesn't it? I'm sure in the newspapers, they were not impressed. And we're thinking we're losing the war. Oh, here's a close up, I forgot I had this. Okay, so here's the Chosen Reservoir and our poor guys marched through that weather all the way down to Hangnam, you see right here, this is all their map. And a lot of people described it kind of like the Trail of Tears only winter and we're losing guys as we go and they're freezing and they have no food and it was really bad let's take a look at some stats from the chosen the united nations had 40,000 in the chosen 
Casualties, 2,500 killed, 5,000 wounded, 7,500 affected by cold injuries, frostbite, losing toes, fingers, hands, stuff like that, and 192 missing. The Chinese had a strength of 120,000, so they outnumbered us three to one. Now look at their casualties. This is kind of interesting. 25,000 killed, 12,500 wounded, and 30,000 with frostbite or cold injuries, and none missing. So what does that tell you? Did they what? Equipment wasn't as good as ours, and you're right. Yeah. Yeah, it's a wave, kind of like at Stalingrad, right? At Enemy at the Gates, yeah. And they really don't care how many of their people get killed. Same thing, and they just get huge casualties. And I have to say that for a small group, they did a lot of damage on the enemy, too, considering it was a tough situation. So, so remember that Truman, President Truman, wanted a limited war because he didn't want China or heaven forbid, the Soviets, to get involved in this war. That'd be a whole world war, wouldn't it? So he was worried about that. MacArthur pushes to bomb China, and even he wants to nuke China. Can you imagine us fighting all of those Chinese people? Holy cow. So they do not get along. So here comes MacArthur in trouble. Uh, he bombs the Yalu River bridges that we talked about. And he attacks Chinese Manchuria. And then he blockaded mainland China. And he also went and he met with the leader of Taiwan. Now, if you remember a little bit back in your world history, remember that Taiwan was created because of the civil war in China, and the losers of that civil war went and lived in Taiwan. So they're Chinese people, but they are kind of our allies, right? They're more like us when it talks about government. Well, MacArthur went and talked to the president or the leader of Taiwan to get him to help us fight China without the president's permission. Can you imagine? That's a president's job to negotiate those things. But he went in there without even telling him. So <clears throat> he's going to get in trouble, no doubt. Truman said, MacArthur has one problem. He thinks he is the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. And he gets fired. He gets removed for insubordination, not following orders because he was told not to go into China. It was a very bold and very unpopular move. A lot of people believe that that is why Truman did not get elected in the next election. April of 1951, uh, MacArthur comes home and he sends a letter um, that um, really attacks the president and Congress. Like, they don't do nothing but sit on their butts, blah, blah, kind of a thing, right? Uh, so April 15th of 50, April 11th of 51, Truman relieves MacArthur of command. He comes home, and they actually have a Senate hearing to decide if that was the right move or not, because he is a hero of World War II, right? So a lot of people love him. 69% support MacArthur. In fact, when he comes home, he comes home to a ticker tape parade in the city. And he said a very famous quote in his speech to Congress. Anybody know what it is? Yes. Old soldiers never die. They just fade away. Yep. And he gets a standing ovation in Congress. It's a 37-minute speech, by the way. And like I told you, they had a ticker tape parade for, for him that was larger than for Eisenhower after World War II. Well, I will tell you, the end of the story, at the time, it looked pretty bad for Truman, and it was. But um, Congress looked at the evidence, and they later found that he was justified in firing him. In fact, they said he should have done it sooner. This guy was disobeying orders all along the line. So, kind of interesting. Sounds kind of like Patton in World War II, doesn't it? Based on some of the things we talked about. 
So the guy that takes over for him is Matthew Ridgway. He also was a World War II commander of the 82nd Airborne. See the flag over here? That's the 82nd. So he's one of those that dropped in behind enemy lines there. In Korea, he was the commander of the 8th U.S. Army that came over from Japan. Uh, and MacArthur trusted him to make decisions on his own. He really did. He was very good. Uh, replaced MacArthur as not only the leader of the U.S. troops, but also the Supreme Allied Commander of NATO, of every soldier over there, basically. He also was the military governor of Japan, because we're still trying to control what happens in Japan after the war. So if you look at his leadership, um, first of all, if you look at his picture over here, you'll notice that he has some things hanging around his neck. Um, he was called Old Iron T, blank, 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 because he wore a grenade here and a first aid kit here right at chest level. So that's why they called him that, if you can figure that out. Yes. His first goal when he took over was to restore the soldier's confidence. Because at this point, they're sitting in those, those trenches or foxholes, and they are cold, and they're tired of this war. So he tries to restore their confidence. He replaced officers that did a bad job. And then uh, he rotated commanders who had not been out for six months with new ones so that they could kind of get a break, get some fresh blood in there too, which was a good idea. And he said, our commanders need to spend more time on the front lines with their men so they know what they're going through and what it feels like on the front line. Which the guys respected, you know? I mean, you want someone who can do it with them. Truman's orders to Ridgeway are to bring peace in Korea. And this is where the first peace talks begin. They don't start at Panmunjom. They actually start at Kaesong first. I don't know if Kaesong is on our... Uh, this just tells you some of our soldiers' experience that he took combat training in Japan before he went into Korea. This guy here was a 21-year-old from Lansing, Michigan that fought in Korea. He was drafted for one and a half years of combat duty in Korea. And he left with five friends to return severely wounded of his group. And I thought this was kind of interesting. It lets you know how darn cold it was. They would sleep on the back of tanks to try to stay warm because the engine would keep them warm. He became a platoon sergeant of the 7th Division, 32nd Infantry. And this group is really famous for the Battle of Pork Chop Hill. He also talks about like the long marches Fatigue, being exhausted, stuff like that. So, just like any other war, we know that there are famous battles, right? D-Day, Battle of the Bulge, Stalingrad. Well, you should know the famous battles of Korea, and we don't always know that, do we? So let's take a look at some of these. Uh, we have a massacre at Hong Song. This was from February 11th through the 13th. It lasted three days in 51. 773 dead or missing, um, and 1,000 wounded. Massacre in May. That one lasted four days the same year. 568 dead or missing, 1,900 wounded. We have the Battle of Bloody Ridge, August 18th through September 5th. Look at that, how long that is. Like 18 days, half a month, a little over. Uh, 2,700 UN casualties, and most of those guys that were casualties were American in that battle. The Battle of Heartbreak Ridge. In fact, there's a movie with uh, Clint Eastwood, have any of you seen it? With Heartbreak Ridge. He talks about that particular battle. Uh, this one lasted 32 days. September 13th through October 15th, 3,700 UN casualties, and again, most of them were American. That is kind of like a, it's kind of like a Battle of the Bulge kind of a thing for them. Well, I wouldn't say Battle of the Bulge, more like D-Day. We have the Battle of Old Baldy from June 26th to August 1st in 52. That one lasted 38 days, 
400 dead, they're missing 100 plus wounded. And again, notice how long these are taking. This isn't a one or two day deal. And that's why they're getting frustrated because they don't feel like they're moving forward, right? You want to try to move forward and we're not getting all that. The Battle of Pork Chop Hill that our gentleman talked about um, was April 16th through the 18th of 53. 104 dead, 300 some wounded. And then they fought at Pork Chop Hill again in uh, July of 53. And we had 243 killed, 900 some wounded, and nine POWs. They talked about how, yes, these guys were good fighters, but their technology was definitely not like ours, like you said, Wyatt. Um, here they were driving buggies and riding ponies, and we had machine guns, you know? So we definitely had better technology in the end. Problem is they had numbers, especially when the Chinese entered. He said on the first wave, they used burp guns. The second wave, they used hand grenades. And the third wave, our soldiers would pick up anything they could from the dead because um, they kept charging up this hill. And every time you charge up the hill, you, you lose more friends. It was very frustrating. All right, we also had some psychological warfare going on. You read about the POW story, but there's also stuff that went on in actual battle. Um, the North Koreans would play over these huge loudspeakers at night. Um, things like, we're coming to get you, GI, you're going to die. Don't you wish you could go home? You know, stuff like that. So that hopefully they would surrender or be frustrated. And if you hear that all night long, it affects you. Because number one, you can't sleep. Number two, you get frustrated, especially if you just get a letter from your girl, a Dear John letter that says she broke up with you. I mean, they tried not to let it bother them, but sometimes it did. And you couldn't control it. So at this point, our next step in the war is a stalemate. Because they're trying to negotiate an end to the war, and we are stuck on the DMZ, on the 38th parallel right there. Huge numbers of casualties, and we're not getting anywhere. Look at this. The peace talks went on for two years. Now think about that. You guys are sitting in a foxhole along the DMZ and you're hearing, oh man, they're talking over there at Kaesong. I think the war's gonna be over soon. And then pretty soon uh, it starts to snow. And then pretty soon it's Thanksgiving and then it's Christmas. And then all of a sudden the spring comes and then it's summer and then another thaw and then another fall. You know what I mean? Two whole years they sat there waiting for this to be over. And it was all because of POWs. That was the hang up. We'll show you that in a minute. Lots of morale problems, as you can imagine. How about this? You know they're negotiating. Would you want to be the one killed the day before the war's over? They were walking lightly because they didn't want to be the ones killed. And then, wow, the war's over the next day. Wouldn't that just be awful? Yeah. So why did it take so long? Like I said, because of prisoners of war. Here was the problem. First of all, let's look at our numbers here. US POWs, we had 7,200 some POWs captured by the North Koreans. 2,800 of our boys died in captivity. 4,418 of them returned to the United States. 21 refused to come home. We'll talk about that on Monday. See you then. Please come to the office. Gracie Cleaver. Megan Sweat. Rebecca Cage.